It is my sincere belief that if you don't think viruses are weird, you don't know enough about them. In the time since I last uploaded a video to this channel, you may have noticed that I acquired some new facial features. This one there, and got a couple up here, and this big one here, yeah. To understand what happened, we have to go back to February, when I was working at a school. So there I am, walking through the corridors of the school, when suddenly I inhale a tiny piece of skin, and you know, that's no big deal, we inhale pieces of skin all the time, it's a fact of life. But this one had a stowaway. A mysterious figure attaches itself to one of the cells lining my nasal cavity. It's fatty envelope merges with the membrane of the cell and bloop! We get our first look at the would-be assailant. It's the varicella zoster virus. Let's back up a moment here. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that biologists do not have a single universally agreed upon definition of what life is, uh, but let's just make the observation that in general, a living organism such as a bacterium or a dandelion or, or you uh, tends to fulfill a few criteria. Firstly, it's made out of cells. These cells can take in energy and materials and make stuff with it and uh, excrete the leftovers as waste. We call this chemical tinkering metabolism. The organism can use this metabolism to build itself, in other words, it can grow, and it can also usually make copies of itself, in other words, it can reproduce. Like all living things, it has some way to sense the world around it and respond to it. And all of these things are made possible because the organism has a unique set of instructions called its genes. But look at this thing! What, what even is that? Viruses don't have cells. In fact, they don't even really have a body. They don't have a metabolism, so they can't eat or grow or produce waste. They don't have any senses, really. Not surprisingly, viruses aren't really usually considered to be alive. But they can do one thing, that is reproduce. Because they do have one thing, and that is genes. In fact, they have very little but genes. Maybe it's more correct to say that they are genes. A virus has been aptly described as a piece of nucleic acid surrounded by bad news. More specifically, it's a smallish amount of DNA, or sometimes RNA, bundled into a coat of proteins called a capsid. Simple as that. They're deceptively inert on their own, but get them into the right kind of cell and magic happens. You see, having DNA on its own is no good. That's like having a recipe with no kitchen. Guess who's the kitchen in this metaphor? It's me. Kitchen. The machinery in my cell starts reading the viral DNA, producing, instead of me proteins, viral proteins. Some of these proteins will start replicating the viral DNA, making more and more copies, and others of the proteins will start to automatically assemble into fresh capsids to stuff the DNA inside of. And voila! More virus particles. Lots more. At this point, some viruses will just keep on replicating, filling the cell with so many virus particles that it eventually just basically explodes. In the case of varicella here, it'll bud off the cell sort of like a bubble, taking with it a piece of the cell's membrane as a traveling cloak. I'm okay with this. In fact, I don't notice at all because, I mean, not to brag or anything, but I have a lot of cells. Of course, this is when the virus goes on to conquer new lands and new tissues. You see, one more thing remains before the virus can complete its life cycle. It has to leave my body and infect someone else. A lot of viruses accomplish this by making your nose run or making you cough and sneeze. That, you know, goes into the air. Simple. Varicella has a rather nastier technique. It accumulates in the skin, forming liquid-filled blisters. Very itchy blisters. Not knowing what's going on, I scratch at them, releasing virus-filled liquid and skin flakes into the air, and as those of you who paused the video before to Google varicella zoster virus already know, I had chicken pox. Most people encounter this virus sometime during childhood, but young me didn't seem to get that memo. As such, my immune system was hilariously unprepared for the attack, and I was in for quite a ride. As my skin gradually transformed into one giant red itch, my body turned up the heat to try and fight the infection, giving me a rather nasty fever. 
As if that wasn't enough, I also experienced dizziness, trouble thinking straight, and even distortions in time perception. At one point I was pretty sure I had meningitis, which is one of the possible effects of adult chickenpox. Not really surprising considering that varicella's favourite place to hang out, besides in the skin, is in the nervous system. Did I mention all of this happened on my week off? Yeah. Yeah. But of course I was fine. My immune system, after a little less than a week, bested the attack, leaving me with nothing more than some awesome battle damage. And I am now immune. Well, basically, probably. Varicella zoster virus can apparently remain dormant in your spine and come back and give you shingles later in life, so there's that to look forward to. But can we just take a moment to appreciate here how strange and amazing it is that our bodies can be colonized and hijacked like that? That everything from my awful but ultimately harmless experience to herpes and the common cold to real terrors and epidemics like Ebola or AIDS can be caused by something so small and simple, a mere bundle of malevolent genes in a tiny protein box. Or icosahedron, or cylinder, or bullet shape, or lunar lander syringe thing. And they're all like unique and beautiful little snowflakes. The simplest living things, bacteria, have you know, typically a few thousand genes. The simplest known virus has only three. Two that help replicate the DNA and one that makes up the protein coat. I mean, if biology were literature, then a virus would be a tweet. They're like rogue bits of DNA that have rebelled against their hosts. Or perhaps parasitic organisms that have lost their own bodies through evolution and now exist only as a kind of genetic ghosts. I mean, one of the strange things about viruses is that we really have no idea where they came from. But given that virtually all living things on this planet have their own respective kinds of viruses, it's a fair bet that they've been with us for about as long as there's been life on this planet. Viruses, you are weird. I salute you.